right, so it is quarter two, week four. As mentioned before, it is the last day of November, so we've burned through three months of the school year already. Um, and today we are going to be examining the cutaneous membrane, which actually most of you already know what it is, even though you don't know it. Um, who's forgotten a manicure or a pedicure? All right, so you sit down, they do all this stuff to you, and they take like a little tool and they push around on this skin. What's that little thing called here? We got the nail, but there's a little flap. Those have gotten a manicure, pedicure. Cuticle. Right, notice here we've got cuta. The Latin prefix meaning um, cover or skin. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that here. Right, so what we're talking when they have the cuticle remover out, they're removing that little piece of skin from right above your nail. Right, so cuta meaning skin. And, uh, Oh yeah, so on your thing, you'll see this already written out, so you just add the extra stuff. Um, all right, so next up in our star question, this is actually a major part of what's happening on Friday's test next week, is um, generally speaking, the questions they ask on the MCATs about the integumentary system, the skin and membranes, are more about how they help you uh, maintain your homeostatic balance. So let's just kind of think about this question and write some um, decent answers to it. What is one of the things the skin does to help us remain healthy and happy? What's the function of this thing? Oh, to heal hmm? um, can you maybe say a little more? If you get a wound, why is that bad? Like if your skin's ripped open. Bleeding. All right, so, all right, so we talked about for one thing about bleeding, right? For one thing, it's, it, it, oh, sorry. For one thing, it maintains shape, and then I'll add her thing too. Right, one of the things that it does is it maintains the shape, right, so it keeps stuff from coming out. Someone just mentioned um, it prevents microbial invasion, right, it keeps germs out. Um, right, we want to keep the, the villains out of our castle. Um, what else? What other things does the skin do to help us stay healthy, happy, and safe? What is a way your skin has been reacting in the past couple of days, when you exit your warm, safe nest at home, it keeps you body. How? Because it, it acts like a membrane. What does the membrane do when it's cold? Keeps up out of this What do you see? It's cold out, I look at my skin. You see goosebumps. You see the skin tighten and contract to keep heating. Right, so one of the things that the skin does is it thermo regulates, right? It maintains your temperature. Um, good teamwork there, folks. Um, right, so it maintains your shape. It uh, prevents microbial or other invasions. It thermoregulates. What else? Some of you do this better than others. And most of you do this thing better than me. <laughs> this is like pretty much the only thing you could ever say that about. Um, so what is it? So, Look around the room, what do we see in terms of variation, like right off the bat? We're young. Well, for, right, we're probably, most of you are 25 years younger than me, right? Um, what else? But like looking around the room, everyone in the room is a different? Colors. Color. Um, right, what does that mean? Why are some people um, from ancestral areas where there, <laughs> there's more dark skin, why are some of us from areas where the skin is lighter? You're almost there. The features. Climate, what about the climate? <laughs> Some people are from areas that there's a lot of what? Climate. Sun, right? One of the things your skin does is to protect you against ultraviolet radiation, against sunlight. Um, so I'm going to put UV radiation, right? So those of you with darker skin, you're better protected against the light of the sun than those of us with lighter skin. So the question you might ask is why is light skin an evolutionary adaptation. Why is it some organisms have lighter skin? If, you, if you're of European descent, um, is there more or less sunlight than an you know, equator area? Less. All right, it's colder and there's what? Less sunlight. Now, does everyone know what vitamin sun helps us produce? D, vitamin D, right? So the more sunlight you can absorb, the more D you can make. And if you live in an area where there's not a lot of sun, like a colder climate like Europe, the lighter your skin, the more of that vitamin D you can produce. Um, all right, awesome. So let's, uh, let's pick someone to read our quote. Yeah, pick me. 
these will not leave a scar, damaging one will, which is which. So I get two cuts, one's really light, one's really deep. Which one leaves a scar? The deep, the deep one, one that damages the dermis. All right, great. All right, now before we go to the next slide, let's see if I can sample some student knowledge here. Um, what are some prefixes meaning under or below? Under or below. What are some prefixes meaning that? One of them we've learned in class recently about a solution that has fewer molecules. Um, there's hypo. And what's the other one? Hypo. Well, hy hyper is above. Right? We're talking still about below. What's a pre? What's another? Sub. Sub. Very nice. Right. So. Uh, next time we're going to talk about the hypodermis or the subcutaneous. Now what you'll find in different textbooks at different times is this part of the skin talked about using either or expression. They actually mean the same thing. Hypo and sub both mean below or under, as I've got in the parentheses here. And dermis or cutaneous both simply mean skin. Um, so we're just talking about the difference between Latin or Greek. Um, and again, you can see that this is in red. You don't have to do the dermal or subcutaneous part of pink. We'll be using pink later on, too. Um, now, the subcutaneous or the hypodermal layer, this is where all of the fat tissue in your body is stored, so, or most of it. It's right underneath that lowest layer of skin. Has anybody ever watched um, any of the YouTube um, showings of surgeries or watched any of the medical shows where they cut someone open? Yeah. What is it you see once they do that really deep incision and they pull it open? What is some of the stuff you see? You see blood, what else? Tissues, what color are some of the tissues you see? White. All right, so she's thinking, sometimes you see that white, yellow, I'll give it to you in a second. Sometimes you see that white, yellow stuff that's like really globular looking and chunky. That's your adipose, that's your fat tissue. Um, yeah, Diana. Oh, you were saying something. All right, it's resolved. Um, all right, now, one of the big misconceptions about fat in our body is the way we talk about it in reference to weight gain or loss. People talk about gaining or losing fat, and that's a little bit of a misrepresentation as we always have the same number of fat cells in our body. It's just about how much oil they're storing at any given time. So full mention seeing like in those medical shows or surgery, you know, surgery videos, they cut it open, they pull you open, you see all this like yellow, white glob stuff? Those are fat cells that are storing a lot of oil at the moment. But if you um, use those calories up through exercise or by eating less, right, the cells shrink. This will happen in a special organelle, an organelle that stores things. Is anybody the name of that organelle, the organelle that stores stuff in the cell? Thank you, sir, a vacuole, right? So fat is stored in the vacuoles of your fat cells. Um, all right, great. And the main purpose, again, is thermal regulation to keep your skin temperature uh, a certain way. All right, next up in brown are our melanocytes. Once again, we have a little flashback word here. Um, we've had the word cytoplasm, we've had glucocytes, we've had urethrocytes. Um, that's uh, brown, please. Um, what, does anyone remember what site meant in the context of your biology class? Like cytoplasm or glucocyte? We have trillions of these in our body. Cells, right? So the prefix or, the prefix or suffix, depending on the word, site means cell. Melanocytes make a pigment known as melanin. Um, some of you might even know what that is, um, as some of you have more than a Please tell us that. It's uh, like what makes your skin color. It's what makes your skin and hair color, actually. Right, so, um, so this protein, this pigment, is produced in these cells, and the purpose is to protect against UV light. What is some evidence we have here? If I go out into the sun and sunlight stimulates my skin, what happens to my skin color? It changes, it changes to what? Uh, right. Darker, right? So this is a stimulus response model, right? I'm exposed to more light. My body produces more melanin to respond to that attack of sunlight. Um, you know, if you're the type of person who spends all your time indoors, what do you expect about your skin tone? It's going to be lighter, you know, uh, than someone who's outside a lot. Your body's only going to produce things it needs, right? It's not going to produce this protein if you're not using it. Um, <laughs> all right, so 
And thinking a little bit back to what do they always say about clothing colors in reference to summer or winter?
All right, good teamwork there, right? So affect, something has done something to someone or something, and then the result is your effect. Okay. So now let's make that same parallel with these words here. Right, the erector pili muscle affects the hair follicle, right? Like affect, uh, you know, erect. And then the result in effect is that the hair becomes erect, right? Whenever something is erect, it's standing straight up. Does that make sense for like the first time? Right. Um, right, so, right, so the effect here is when the hair becomes erect. What are two physiological responses that make your hair stand up? What are two things that happen that might make your hair go up? Static. Or, well, there's environmental influences like static. We're thinking about more like a, a feeling your body has. Coldness. All right, coldness, right? When you, were, you ever notice when you're cold, like the little hairs all stand up? It creates an insulating cushion of heat. Very nice. What? What are other times that you see your hair standing straight up? When you're scared. When you're scared, when you're really upset, anxious, angry. Does this happen with our other animals too? Do other animals like fluff up yes, when they're yeah. angry? Yeah. A hedgehog. Yeah, a hedgehog. Oh, right? Are those things in the water? Oh, no. right. the thing. A little pufferfish? Yeah, right? This is what's known as a vestigial response. All right, so Christine's really excited to share this because it seems like she's already started talking about it. So, Christine, do you remember from chapter two? What was what was a vis, what was a vestigial structure or behavior? And I'll give you a hint: whales have hip and leg bones. What? So, who remembers this from chapter two? Let's see if she remembers. Is it like the bones? Do whales use hips and legs? No. Why do they have them? Then we had a huge discussion about this. All right, there's, there's an evolutionary part to it for sure. Are whales fish? No, they're mammals. They breathe. Do they have gills? No. All right, who were their ancestors? Who remembers this? Me. They remember this? We had a whole diagram on it. We took tests on it too. How long was this? Of course. It was all class. I did the same thing with everybody. Um, so if, where are mammals usually found? We'll make, that, we'll, we'll make it a little easier for folks. Where are mammals usually found? Water. All, most mammals live in the water. Cats, dogs, bats. Land. Land. On land. So therefore, the ancestors of whales came from the? Land. So they have the hip bones because they're? Mammals. Mammals, right? They have ancestral mammals. So the reason our hair stands up, just like other animals, like she mentioned with the puffer fish, right? It's a, it's a vestigial behavior. We don't have hair all over our bodies anymore to fluff up like a cat would, but our ancestors had that ability. All right, that is so good to get an express test. Mr. Can I use you back, please? Huh? Can I use um, Passes right here. Um, all right, so in our lighter green, we have our sebaceous glands. And you guys are very fortunate because you are in the period of your life where your sebaceous glands are the most active, right? So your skin is producing a lot of oil right now, which keeps it um, soft and lubricated, as well as keeps pollutants from getting down and deep into it. What is evidence that, like visual evidence from people you've seen in your lifetime, that you produce less oil in your skin as you're older? What does skin start to look like as you get older? Isn't that really good? All right, once it gets wrinkled and it's cracks, right, it gets drier, right? So someone like me who's, you know, I'm 50, or sorry, 25 to Whoa. 24 years older than some of you guys, right? I'm producing far less oil in my skin than you, right? So I'm, so my skin's not all shiny and soft and glowing, you know, in the way that yours is. Um, it will never be again. Um, all right, and... This sebaceous gland is attached to the hair follicle, right? And so this oil comes up along the hair and then out onto the skin. And has anyone ever had an ingrown hair? Yeah. What's that? Wait, are you talking about those people that have like barely hair down here? You know, this is a situation where one of your hair follicles gets really irritated and red and painful. Yeah, like some, some folks get them. Um, and often it could be that your sebaceous gland has become lodged, like there's oil trapped in there, um, or that the oil hasn't moved out enough to remove dead cells and it just gets all clogged up and painful.
painful and irritated. And then you pluck the hair out and it clears and it's better. Um, right? All right, cool. So on to our last three words. We're going to use pink next. Um, all right, so in pink we've got our um, Pisidian core puzzle. Um, before we go on any further, Pisidian core puzzle is one of the cells of your body that receives information from the environment, that receives stimuli. What do we call those kinds of cells? Cells that like, like experience stuff and feel things and send information. Nervous. Nerves, right? So this is a kind of nerve. All right, so um, the Pisidian corpuscle detects pressure, it detects te texture, it's sensitive to temperature, um, and it signals the parietal lobe, which folks might remember from chapter one. Um, and we're going to take some unfortunate soul to tell us where the parietal lobe was in the brain. Of course, they might be looking at chapter one notes they don't remember. Yes, Ms. Gay. Um, when the young lady who is out returns. All right. Um, and Coco, we'll take your lucky D. Um, so could you remind me what part of the brain is the parietal lobe? Where is it? Top, bottom, middle, center, back. I think you lost, you didn't have your first, you don't have your first. All right. Um, could someone look back in chapter one at our, at our lateral view of the brain, our side view of the brain, tell me where the parietal lobe is. Indeed, these guys kind of remember already, right? It's right here at the, uh, the uh, most superior region of your brain. Very nice. Um, now that we've gotten this far, we actually need to review um, something from the earlier slide. We're going to choose a really easy question here. Eddie, how many layers of the skin are there? Sure, how many layers of skin are there from the earliest part of our notes today? <laughs> they all have the word dermal in them. Layers of the skin, how many? Look again, look at your notes. Three, great. Okay, now there is a homeostatic disruption, a damage that can happen to your body that is categorized in three levels. What is a way that your skin can be damaged? And we talk about it as being in three different levels. There's scrapes and cuts, sure. Could leave a scar. The sun might be the cause of this. <laughs> We're getting closer. All right, say more. Is there just one kind of burn? What's the way we talk about burns? Boy, you getting burnt by fire? Anybody? Burn? Eat. Please, one more time. I think you said it right. First Someone said that. There's first degree and. All right, so what that means is there are three layers of the skin, right? First degree burns damage the epidermis. Second degree burns damage the, in orange, dermis. And third degree burns damage the? Great. All right, now I get those burns. The second, third degree burn are where the nerves are. So if I receive a second or third degree burn, what might I not be able to do anymore in that area of my body? Move or more, more importantly, feel, right? You might not have sensitivity there anymore. Right out of the scar tissue forms, the nerves don't grow back. Um, all right, let's move on. Next up are our blood vessels. In purple, yep, blood vessels in purple. And this was the whole topic of the last chapter. Right, so our blood vessels exchange heat with the surface of the skin. Our blood vessels um, extract. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing the whole time. Insulting us. Pull yourself together. Uh, all right, so. All right, so. In a moment, I'm going to do another little, little um, popsicle stick sampling. Um, no projectiles, please, students. Somebody could be injured. I need purple. Um, how can you make purple? Take your red, shade it, and a little blue on top, and you're good to go. Um, all right, so um, I want to review from the last chapter the three types of blood vessels. So we're going to get the cup going. Um, all right, so.
So, right, Choco, you're first up. Um, which blood vessel takes blood away from the heart? Arteries, very nice. And Tiffany, which blood vessel exchanges gases with all the cells in your body? Sounds like the name of the most important person in the room. Capillaries, very nice.